Guys, this is the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. We are about to inaugurate our 44th president, first African American for a second term. It's very powerful. But the bottom line is we all know all is not right in Camelot. And this, <laughs> okay, that's the truth. And this data helps to expose that problem. Now, a couple of guys named Dan and Jonathan Gillespie, uh, they estimated in a really fine paper uh, for the last month that more than 3 million children in K through 12 have lost instructional seat time in the 2009 2010 academic year because they were suspended from school. Because they were suspended from school. 3 million people. Now, that's more kids than you could use to fill every major league baseball stadium and football stadium in the country. And still have rooms. Okay, still have to combine. Now data from the Department of Education's uh, civil rights data collection uh, was sampled about 85% of students from K through 12. Suggests that across all districts, as we've seen here, African Americans are three and a half more times likely to be suspended or expelled than their white peers that students with disabilities are two times more likely to receive one or more other school suspension than other students, and that 70% of students arrested and referred uh, to law enforcement for disciplinary problems are black or Latino, and that number is wrong. That number is wrong. Now these numbers really are astounding by any uh, but they are unconscious. And in my judgment, they define the crisis that compels policy to take decisive action. So here's my last historic reference. It's been 60 years since Brown versus the Court of Education in the South. I understand that Brown can't be expected to remedy every societal ill that was associated with separate but equal racially discriminatory policies that amounted to an American version of I, I grew up partly in that time period, but I'm fortunate enough to have lived beyond it to see changes that we would hope not to have each other. And so there was great hope that Brown could help accomplish many of those goals that we thought that were so fundamental. Here's the problem. This data from these figures suggests that we created a new discriminatory system that uses zero tolerance policies including out-of-school suspensions mm -hmm. that make race one of the most significant factors affecting whether or not a child uh, will have access to a quality public ed education, graduate from high school, avoid the criminal justice and juvenile justice systems, and go on to post-secondary education. Poverty is obviously also a variable that helps further refine the population of people that we're talking about. And when you combine this with other systemic inequities uh, that really amount to a sort of quasi-permanent exile uh, for the educational system, uh, this really does constitute the building blocks of the school to prison pipeline. Now, I conducted a set of hearings this summer with others at the law school that examined policies here in the District of Columbia that looked at out-of-school suspensions. And to my shock and horror, to find out that a kid could be suspended for up to 10 days without a due process review, mm -hmm. and that you could string those suspensions along to constitute a month of suspension time, or that there is a spike in suspensions when schools are being evaluated on adequate dealing progress, <laughs> okay. or that a kid in kindergarten can be suspended for nonviolent activity, give me a break. And when you string this stuff together and look at the consequences that flow, down the road, these judgments are not the sort of benign, innocent uh, decisions that have no impact and sort of really touch a kid up around this. The truth is, they have profound impact and implications for society as we know uh, down the road. So, uh, we've talked about sort of positive interventions. Jimmy did a great job, by the way, of highlighting the individual <coughs> But one thing that really stood out uh, for me is that there obviously are systems that are subjected to the same forces of 
economic deprivation, racial isolation, failure to have meaningful relationships, or lack of adequate leadership in their schools. And yet they have been able to reduce out of school suspensions without a significant depreciation of the security of their school, increase their graduation rate, and at the same time improve the overall environment of our schools. I'm not a shock to find out that Baltimore had been able to make these adjustments in part because of a more visionary, more humane state policy that responds to these uh, circumstances. And while we can't take and study the best practices in places like Baltimore and elevate them in ways that are useful uh, to other communities, is really the young. So think about policy recommendations, guys, and I'll try to be very clear. Look, we have 50 state systems of public education. Okay, 50 state systems. You know, a, a quality education is a precept of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I take that very seriously as an individual right that every child in America has. I regret to tell you, though, this is also the 50th anniversary of the Supreme Court's decision in San Antonio versus Rodriguez, which denied fundamental constitutional status to quality education and consigned every child in America to a 50 state system based on states' rights precepts. And in places where you know states' rights have been appropriate, for intentional and sometimes albeit unintentional discrimination, systemic discrimination, can't possibly expect an adequate remedy to be achieved unless we have some sort of progressive. So here are my recommendations. The Department of Justice of, uh, Civil Rights uh, Division and the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights need to collaborate more closely in both gathering data forcing data to be adopted, disaggregating that data, and analyzing that data. There has to be a greater willingness to utilize existing remedies. I know that this is controversial, but Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 stares you in the face and tells you that the kind of discrimination which is made evident by these studies of this data is in violation of that act, even if it is not in violation of the Constitution as we know it. There has to be a willingness to use the enforcement tools at hand and to challenge states that have been resistant to the kind of changes that we have projected. There has to be a willingness to use executive authority by the president. Please back. If states are unwilling to provide data, which is required under the existing law, we have to be willing to penalize them. And you can do it one of two ways. You can give them incentives, and that usually means cash to do the right thing. And if you had it, you could use it. But with the kinds of deficits that we have in place today, it's ridiculous to think that you're going to be able to pay states to do what they should do under the existing mandates of the law. I also think you've got to, uh, quite frankly, be willing to sort of say, you've got to push the envelope. So the, the shift, there has to be a burden shifting analysis which says that even though these systems were adopted for all the right reasons, and there is no intentional intentionality to discriminate on the basis of race or ethnic status. You know, I'm prepared to believe that. There's no intentionality to do so. But the disparate impact and the significant consequences that flow uh, from these suspensions should shift the burden such that the use of out of school suspensions is no longer an appropriate response other than the most limited of circumstances. And there has to be a burden-shifting mechanism that puts the burden of proof on the institution that chooses to use that policy. I'm not suggesting that the policy shouldn't be available, but there has to be a willingness to measure the use of that policy against objective and evidentiary standards, which this data helps present. It's no longer sufficient to have a principal or a teacher say I've suspended, recommended suspension because of some ill-defined behavioral circumstance that can't adequately be documented with the evidence of misbehavior in school. That's just not right. So my view is that we're going to have to take action now. When Judy says young people are at the helm of change, then that's absolutely right. I mentioned one organization that's a member of our coalition that we work with. It's called Public Change. That's on the left. Uh, but the bottom line is they are a young
young group that uses the web to organize social justice and they do a great job. So here's the bottom line. I think until we get this right, this data warrants a nationwide suspension of out moratorium on out of school suspensions, pending a systemic review of federally and state by state to determine whether these policies as currently applied meet the standard that we laid out as an objective. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, uh, look, we have 40 million people in this country who don't have a high school mm -hmm. Now, some of them, obviously not all of them, are victims of overzealous disciplinary problems. I have no idea what percentage of that 40 million were affected by the policies which have been identified, but you know some of them have. In today's society, you can't function without a high school diploma or its equivalent. And so we're going to have to use the general education diploma, the GED. We're going to have to invest in making GED uh, available, more widely available. And we're going to have to tie it to community colleges so that there is some ability to move beyond the static of the high school equivalent to meet the demands of society as we find them. And so all of this has to be taken together in a comprehensive way. I think the uh, statistics and the data that have been provided by the researchers helps us do that. And I think this is a wonderful start to what I hope will be the building of a new movement in this anniversary of great civil rights accomplishments. There is much more to do. Thanks very much.